Um, the screen says it's 702, that one says it's 659. Um, just a couple of changes with the schedule. So, uh, Param Nair, who's a speaker from McMaster in Canada, who comes like every second year, is just a brilliant guy. Emily, you can come in here. Emily. 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 He's, well, you want to, you're welcome to come in. The boss is called. Sit here. Um, <laughs> uh, so he, he had a dropout. He's going to come early in the fall. Um, but I filled the spot with another superb guy, Ray Panateri, who's a pul famous pulmonologist at Penn, actually now moved up to Rutgers, so he'll be coming. And we still have one open spot. And what I'm thinking of doing with the just recent release of the new peanut product, which is of great interest, obviously, in our specialty, is have Steve Tillis come. So Steve works for the company Immune that makes it. So he can't come and give a CME talk. But if we just say it's a non-CME, I can work that out with the CME office. Um, I think it would be of mutual interest. Steve, you know, would give a very honest presentation of the development of that product and um, and how they intend to market it and the problems that are going to come up. So I think that would be worthwhile to fill that, that empty slot. Um, so then, um, why is this slide up here? Um, so as you know, I usually uh, just ramble and say things that interest me before we get started. And we just had the Oscars. And so two things about movies. Uh, you know, two weeks ago when I was last up here, I was terribly upset um, about Kobe's death, and I still am, uh, and also about the state of world affairs. <laughs> so both of these have to do with movies and Kobe and the state of world affairs. And uh, there was an article uh, that I found in the New York Times. This is not about Casablanca. This is about Kobe. So when he retired, he made uh, an animated movie called Dear Basketball, summarizing his career. And he did it with an animator. And there's this article in the New York Times, I'll just read it to you. So the guy who worked with him named Keen, the two men bonded through their shared love of Beethoven. You don't usually think about basketball players loving classical music. So this guy Keen, who animated Beauty and the Beast, which used Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, was amazed to learn that in one championship game, Kobe structured his performance and the strategy of the game to the rhythm of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. <laughs> it's sort of amazing. You don't think of a basketball player with that level of intelligence and skill um, and love and appreciation of classical music. So that... Um, I've been a Laker fan my whole life, and so I'm still hurting a lot of, of this tragic death. The reason this movie, this is up here is um, also has to relate to movies. So on the flight home, I came home from Hawaii on Saturday, and I watched this movie. You know, on Alaska Airlines now, there's an app, and you can watch for free. So this has always been my favorite movie. I don't know of young people. How many people in this room know this movie, have seen it? Okay, so for my generation, or at least me personally, I would still say this is the greatest movie of all time. So I watched this movie, and as you remember, it's in 1941 in French Morocco. Um, we're in the midst of World War II, and the world is in tremendous upheaval. So the world is in some upheaval right now. So what came, the thoughts that came to me were, there were worse times in world history. It was World War II it was a worse time than now. Um, but the war ended and democracy was saved. And moreover, um, the US was clearly viewed as the beacon of democracy at that time. Everybody wanted to come to the US. That was everybody's goal in that movie was to, to flee totalitarianism and come to the US. So. Anyway, it's Oscar time, two movies, two things that struck me 
um, which have nothing to do with allergy whatsoever. Um, so just some musings on uh, things that went through, through my head. Um, all right. <laughs> Now he he can sing the famous you know the move the the piano in that movie that Sam played sold for I think a million dollars or so to some collector. And the famous song "As Time Goes By." All right. Anyway, so the next two weeks, so today and next week, are presentations on immunotherapy, and I usually have this each year because if you think about it, this is really the bread and butter of allergy practice and. Unless it gets replaced by biologics, which I would say at this time are too expensive to replace standard immunotherapy, this is every guy, every person who's a practicing allergist in this room or listening to me, they'll go back to their office and write a half dozen orders in a day to put people on immunotherapy. And yet we don't usually talk about it, how we got to this point of developing this technique and what we know about it. So it's always worthwhile to review that. So the first presentation today, Catherine's going to give us and move on from movies. All right. OK, so yeah, um, basically, it's going to be a two part series. Um, I'm going to be speaking this week. And then Cass, my colleague, will be uh, speaking next week. Um, so you can save all questions for next week for him, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I have no disclosures. And as we just saw, my dad tends to do silly random things in the morning. And so rather than picking um, a boring, predictable uh, word of the day that often I find is up here, I thought we'd do something that has nothing to do with the topic of the talk, um, just spice it up. So I picked Bosco as my word of the day. I'm just curious, does anybody actually know what Bosco is? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is it? That's a chocolate chocolate. Drink. Well, that's true, but what else is it? A saint. It's George's from Seinfeld's ATM password oh. code. <laughs> oh, <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you all failed me. Um, okay. So this is just a brief overview of what we're going to be speaking about today. Um, and so just uh, quickly, I'm going to go through the history of allergy uh, immunotherapy and how it first came to be used and then um, how we got to where we are today as far as treatment. Um, and then I'm gonna go into the efficacy of subcutaneous. And so the way Cass and I divided up our talk for the most part is I'm gonna be focused on um, subcutaneous and he's gonna be focusing on sublingual. Um, and so at, I'm not gonna really go into sublingual aside from briefly addressing it in the history part. Um, and then I think like one aspect of it comes up a little bit later, but for the most part, I'm just gonna be focusing on subcutaneous. Um, and then I'm gonna go into um, how we determine kind of the standard recommended duration that individuals <coughs> remain on therapy. So how did we arrive um, at recommending to our patients three to five years of treatment? And then what um, kind of tolerance are we seeing observed after they uh, discontinue treatment? Um, and then I'm actually going to transition completely away from the medicine and the science. And I just thought going into kind of cost and the health economics of, of uh, immunotherapy, um, as my dad mentioned, you know, maybe someday a biologics, but at this point, this seems to be certainly more uh, cost effective. Um, and if, if this is actually um, saving us money if, rather than just putting people on medications. Um, so, okay, uh, as far as history, so basically, um, Allergy shots first started being used back in 1911. Um, Noonan Freeman in London um, first started empirically uh, using it, um, and they had this mistaken concept that pollen was basically a toxin. And um, the, uh, they were by giving allergy shots, they were creating some sort of antitoxin that was treating symptoms. Um, and so kind of similar to what we do with vaccination today for infectious disease, that's what they presumed was going on. And for decades, that was kind of just the empiric treatment. They really didn't understand the mechanism or what was going on. They had observation that this was effective, but there were no controlled studies that were showing that it was um, effective. And so it wasn't until the 1950s and 60s when the first um, placebo controlled trials were done in both the United States and uh, the UK that in fact confirmed that this is uh, efficacious. Um, and then it wasn't until like uh, 1965, about the same time by two different groups, um, one in the United States, I cannot pronounce that last name, the Is Ish Ishakas or something like that, in the United States, um, and then Benick and Johansson in Sweden, uh, more or less simultaneously discovered IgE. And so that's when we first gained an understanding of um, allergic disease and kind of the mechanism of action of immunotherapy. 
they win the Nobel Prize conjointly, or does anybody remember? Sure, why not? <laughs> no. They, she talks with her at Hopkins, but they didn't get the Nobel Prize. So did the Swedes get it, or no, 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 no Nobel Prize for this discovery? Not IGE. When they awarded for that. Right. Yeah, actually, there was, I think, the, back in like 1900s, there was um, anaphylaxis was awarded. It was a out of um, a dagger, out of, um, I mean, a marine thing in France, but I, I don't think it ever got Nobel Prize for the, the area. Right. Um, so then in 1986, um, the first well, pause. Actually, you know, this started out, but um, this is a little <laughs> target, but Stand it up, was a Nobel, huh? Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> there was a Nobel Prize for leukotriene biology. So right. Was, and, that, and that was very controversial. Um, Austin's group in Boston and also a group in Sweden, right, were basically co discoverers. Well, um, for leukotriene, uh, Charlie Parker at WashU figured out it was from arachidonic acid, and Austin was working on it very closely. He discovered like the slow reaction substance of anaphylaxis, the right. biologic activity, but they didn't get the structure of uh, Samuelson and uh, and then they also awarded that year to the um, person who discovered prostaglandins. Land, so Samuelson, that was the Swedish group, got the Nobel Prize. But yeah, the story so I heard, so K. Frank Austin, extremely famous allergist at the Brigham in Boston, still working in his 90s so what, what i heard is a story when he did not get co-awarded the nobel prize for work in leukotriene biology his mother said what's wrong with you, <laughs> you know, why he didn't get co-awarded the nobel he didn't prize structure that was the problem with him okay <laughs> Um, all right, so in 1986, um, the first uh, randomized double-blind uh, placebo control trial for um, sublingual uh, for dosmite um, happened, and then in 1998, the World Health Organization um, published a position paper that it was accepting um, SLIT as an alternative uh, when compared to SKIT based on four trials. And then this was updated uh, in 2009 based on 60. Um, and then in the same year, uh, the FDA first approved uh, sublingual treatment in the United States um, for both grass and ragweed. Um, does that come up well? Yeah, okay. So um, before I get into any specifics, I just kind of came across this table and thought it would be helpful just kind of a, a brief overview of what we know about both uh, SKIT and SLIT um, and um, just kind of showing that yeah, we know they're effective for allergic rhinitis and asthma. They, uh, yeah. Um, whoops. Um, yeah, so I mean, basically, both are effective for um, uh, seasonal uh, allergic rhinitis. They both in, uh, induce long term remission. Um, and uh, they're both effective for perennial, so seasonal and perennial. Um, and then, you know, going into it a little bit more, uh, there's certainly issues in terms of adherence. So with, you know, with SKIT, you're going to have potentially better adherence because these individuals are having to come into the office for it, whereas a, um, you know, sublingual can be done at home. That said, certainly patient preference for if they're going to be on it, uh, or whether they have to travel or not for shots versus being able to do it at home. Different side effect profiles for them um, in terms of local side effects um, uh, as far as like mouth irritation with sublingual versus pain and swelling at the site. And then um, obviously concern for anaphylaxis and why they have to stay at the office for 30 minutes afterwards. Um, and then I'm not going to get into this, but you know, there's there's a little bit of data suggesting um, that uh, when you compare the two head to head, um, skit is a little more effective. I believe Kess might go briefly into this a little bit next week, but um, but I'm not going to get into it today. And if he's not getting into it next week, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so now going into the efficacy. So um, broke this up into two. So focusing on allergic rhinitis and then for asthma. Um, so if we're focusing just on allergic rhinitis, so a meta-analysis um, of 51 studies, about 3,000 patients looking at seasonal allergic rhinitis. Um, so in, the, in all of these different studies, the patients were 
uh, allergic to and treated for various different allergens, so different grasses, various trees, as well as ragweed. And they looked at three different outcome measures, um, and so that would be uh, symptom scores, medication scores, or reduction in medication use, as well as quality of life. And as you know, basically zero, meaning no difference between placebo and, uh, and treatment, um, and so any negative value basically in favor of treatment. So as you can see, for all outcome measures, um, it was overall in favor of um, active treatment when compared to placebo. And so just kind of going into what this looks like visually, here's breaking down all the various studies, so everything being skewed towards the left, so being in favor of active treatment. Here at the bottom, you see that little diamond there. That's basically the average of the, the number that was on that prior slide. So this one is, is looking at for symptom scores, um, and then uh, this one being for medication scores, so again, everything on the left, and uh, overall average being in favor of treatment, and then likewise for quality of life. So then, uh, similarly, looking at it for asthma, um, another meta-analysis uh, with some more reports, so 88 reports, about 3,500 people in this case, um, the individuals were allergic to and treated for house dust mite allergy, various pollens, as well as pet dander. Um, and the outcome measures here were symptom scores, medication use, um, and then lung function. And what they observed in this was that basically for two of the three, um, it was in favor of active treatment. So for symptom scores and medication use, um, they found that uh, subcutaneous was better than placebo, um, although they did not observe any changes in lung function. Um, and so then kind of visually, what does this look like? So this, this one, this table, at least broke it down by what the allergen was. So the top being for mite allergy, but again, the diamond still denoting the average. Um, and then this being for the pollens, and then this they label as other, but that would be for like the pet allergen. And so then overall, this is the average here. Um, so this is the one for the asthma symptom scores, for the medication scores, and then for lung function, as you can see, basically just hovering right around zero, so more or less no difference between active treatment and placebo. Is that what people see? Do you see that standard immunotherapy makes pulmonary function better or not? I never thought about it really. But, uh, so the medication needs to go down, but I'm uh, not sure it changes pulmonary function. Well, this data says it doesn't. I, I, never really evaluated it. Uh, they all stop using their inhalers. That's all I know. Possible. But did they break down any of the studies with regard to allergen? Uh, you mean like, well, I mean, so yeah, in this one they did. Um, you can see at this table, they, I mean, they have it. So looking at all of these, this, uh, they're looking at, you know, mite allergy versus pollen versus other. So house dust mite various pollens, and then um, other, in, I found, was basically all pet danders or cat and dog. Because there could be a difference in, you know, some of those are proteases, sure. and like animal models of asthma, they're more effective. I mean, it's different pathways to induce yeah. immunologically. So, I mean, that would favor then the, those are the mites that were most affected. Yeah. Never Have you seen some more there. recent studies? This was like, 20 years ago, I guess. That's yeah, I mean, uh, this was the one that had like a good meta-analysis in total, but everything seemed to fit up in line with more recent studies too. I just took this table because this was a good table or chart. I don't think anybody's really analyzed Skip more recently. All the more recent studies have all been about sublingual. But I never thought about what you just said. You, you inferred that the mechanism of immunotherapy would be different based on what allergen you were giving, that if it was my yeah, it could be quite a bit different, the mechanism. I don't know that anybody's ever studied that. I mean, we usually just accept that you, IgE stays about the same. You make IgG subclass 4. Some of these are more innate immune responses with regard to the, um, well, there's chitinases and some of these the proteases that are, depending on what the thing is, like it's a fungus or... Um, particularly the dust mite. So you can induce toll receptors and other things that are... But I don't know, is there data or are you just speculating? Oh, I was just speculating. Okay. <laughs> I was just curious about that because in mouse models it's quite a bit different from a, um, you know, if you're inducing with pollen. It makes sense. I don't think anybody studied it. I think the storyline of the mechanism is pretty much worked out in the <coughs> 
and then we just say that's the way it works. Um, okay, so basically over the course of doing all these various studies, um, one, they, people and, and researchers came to observe that there is um, kind of a minimum effective dose that needs to be given for um, various uh, allergens um, and that there are in fact ineffective doses that we get but can be given. Um, so I thought this was just an important slide to put up uh, to know that we need to kind of use a standardized maintenance uh, treatment dose because uh, otherwise you're not going to be getting the intended benefit that you want for your patients. Um, and so this breaks it down by allergen um, as far as um, what dose you need to be getting your uh, individual patients up to. The last one go back to that, is Alternaria, which is the dominant mold that causes disease in the rest of the country. We don't have it here. You've had this topic before. I never put anybody on mold immunotherapy. I'm wondering if you old timers in the room, in this region, anybody use mold immunotherapy in their practice? Occasionally threw it in if there was room. Of course, the argument was always that it had proteases and it would destroy the other allergies. Yeah, well, that's the other problem. If you're going to do it, you're not supposed to throw it I in know. with other things. Yeah. So I've always thought. Although, if I'm mistaken, you can put. No, never mind. I was going to say something about that. But, yeah. And you can cockroach and all the other cockroaches. Yeah. But I, I never used it on the assumption people aren't exposed here. So even if they're skin test positive, they acquired that sensitivity in another part of the country and they're not exposed in the Northwest. Plus the data that it's effective is pretty weak. You've got a study there, at least two studies saying that they know how much microgram of protein you need to get an effect. That's just my opinion that I, I've never really thought mold immunotherapy was something to do in the Northwest. Because the caddies, a lot of people travel or like spend summers at home and such, so, um, yeah. So are you doing it here at the university? I, right I, orders? I, I've done a couple, a couple of patients, um, and they're usually the ones who grow up in the Midwest. And yeah, same so kind of thing. There. I probably have five to ten patients total on, it's very rare that I put someone on hold. I actually saw the, one of the politicians from Alaska and he brought his wife down and her skin test to alternary was huge. It was like 30 by 50. And we put her on immunotherapy and that was the only allergen that showed up. And she her asthma went away, her symptoms Alaska. all went away, so my case report of one. <laughs> it actually worked out really she well. Alaska? No, she had moved there from the Midwest. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to transition uh, to the duration of treatment, kind of how we came to establish the rec uh, recommendation that people be on allergy shots for three to five years and what data there are to uh, support this. So I'm going to go through a couple of different studies um, that looked at these uh, treatment uh, ranges. Um, so this is the first study that uh, I'm going to be going into. Um, and so basically in this study, uh, they took 90 kids. Uh, kind of preteen ages um, who are monosensitized to dust mite and they got randomized to three different groups. So one group didn't get any allergy shots, one group got three years and one group got five years. Um, and they measured asthma remission, FEV1 and their inhaled corticosteroid dose. And so basically this uh, chart over here shows the study design or kind of how they did it. And so more or less, this is the time where they were getting their allergy shots or lack thereof. And here is mark zero is when they actually started collecting data. So when they stopped shots, they followed them for three years afterwards and they checked in on all of these outcome measures. And what they found was basically uh, one year after treatment, the inhaled corticosteroid dose was reduced by 75% in the five-year group and 50% in the three-year group, which was statistically significant. And so that's what's over here. So basically between the two treatment groups, um, there was statistical significance at one year follow-up. And likewise, also both compared to control was um, statistically significant. However, when they followed up again three years later, more or less that benefit was not observed again. Um, and so the two groups are more or less equal. So there was initial benefit, but it didn't seem to sustain uh, afterwards. And uh, so that's what's kind of visualized over here. So they were both better than control, but no difference between the two groups. And that's in, in far, as far as uh, inhaled corticosteroid reduction. Um, and then for asthma remission at the three year follow-up period, um, both groups are more or less equal. So they're both at about 55 or 50% or so. Um, 
when compared to controls, which are 3.3%. So both were better than controls, but between the two groups, they were basically equal. Um, and so what the authors concluded from this was more or less that three years is sufficient. And in far, as far as asthma, you didn't gain any uh, benefit from doing an additional two years. Um, so then another study um, looking again at dust mite allergy. This one's a little bit different though in that uh, it was kids, uh, so 81 kids who had house dust mite uh, allergic rhinitis and or asthma. So the other study was just asthma. This one, they could have both. Um, and they looked at um, asthma and rhinitis symptoms and medication use. And basically the study designed for this was that both groups got three years of allergy shots, but then um, one group didn't get any more and one group went on for another two years. And then at, uh, they followed up with them um, at the end of those five years. And they were both equally controlled at the end of those five years. Um, so basically what they observed was the three-year group, even though they didn't get those additional two years of, tre of treatment, they didn't get any worse. And they were just, and they were equal to the five-year group. So um, after three years, asthma, symptom control, medication use were both reduced to kind of the same value. And so they didn't get significantly better from those additional two years. That's in regards to asthma. However, when they went in to look at allergic rhinitis part of it, um, the five-year treatment group did actually get a little bit better. So about 30% difference, which was statistically significant. So you can, as you can see here, they're verging off from the other treatment group. Um, so more or less asthma was observed to be about the same between the two treatment groups, but then rhinitis um, did seem to get better for these kids. And then another study uh, done by Steve Durham's group in the UK um, looking at grass pollen. Um, so in this study, they uh, took patients who had had three or four years of allergy shots previously, and they divided them into two groups. So one group um, continued on for another three years and one group got placebo injections. And they checked in on hay fever symptoms and red rescue medication use. And um, when they followed up, they basically found that the, the medication use and their hay fever symptoms more or less were the same. Um, so the group that had gotten three years of shots and didn't get any more sustained their benefit from those and nothing further was added by doing those additional three years. Um, and so then also uh, one thing different in this study than compared to the other studies was that they did um, intradermal injection to grass allergen um, to try to see if they were able to elicit um, a T cell response. And um, compared to controls, there wasn't. So that's what's actually being shown over here is basically controls over here. As you can see, this is given the dilutant and then the allergen. So markedly up here, the, this is the skin response for the maintenance, that being the group that got another three years of shots. This is the group that stopped and got placebo. And so this is their response. So basically about the same, between the two groups. This is the um, CD3 and then IL4 mRNA um, for those. So basically they were fail they failed to elicit um, a, uh, a T cell response and the little squares over here is kind of the average of the groups. So as you can see, more or less equal between the two. So these authors concluded that uh, the clinical benefit um, and immunologic changes were observed uh, with three years of treatment and that was sustained afterwards. So naturally, I think people wondered, could we shorten the course? Could we go to two years instead of three? And so one study um, that uh, looked at grass allergy in individuals who had moderate to severe seasonal allergic rhinitis, they had three different treatment groups. Um, and one group got two years of slit, one group got two years of skit, and then one got uh, double placebo, so basically fake shots and fake pills. Um, and what they did was they performed nasal challenge. They literally basically just injected grass stuff in their nose, um, and then collected symptom scores. And uh, their symptom scores were ranging from 0 to 12, 12 being the greatest burden of disease. Um, and then they followed them uh, for three years, well, for two years, and then stopped treatment, and then followed them for one year afterwards. And so this uh, chart here is, is, is looking at skit. So I took, I created my own chart because I wanted to take away the slit part of it. Um, and uh, this is the median symptom scores. So as you can see, these are the, two, the symptom scores average for uh, prior to starting therapy, and then you can see a reduction in the skit group. However, at the red arrow, which is when they stop treatment, you see regression or rebound of their symptoms. Um, and I should note there was statistical significance between these in these years between um, the placebo group and the skit treatment group, um, whereas they then observed the rebound of symptoms here. So basically, two years, not good enough. Mm -hmm. 
So I thought I'd actually just kind of stop at this point and open up a question to the audience, just kind of how long those of you out in practice tend to actually treat. I've now presented data that shows that three to five years, but I know some people may practice differently. And then kind of how long do you keep your patients on that? And how long do you actually observe people remain in remission? Does it just, is what you observe similar to what the data shows or are you seeing totally different findings? I think the data is better than what I see in practice. Um, I don't know what the rest of you think, but I've always told people to stay on for five years. So <coughs> this would say three years is enough, and you stay in remission for at least three years after you stop. How long? If you give people, that's what this data would just say, right? If you've got three years of shots, you do well, and that's enough to stop almost all parameters for how long and, and and then for at least three years more that people were followed they stayed in remission without more treatment I, I don't see that in the real world I see a lot of people come back <laughs> one year after stopping and say my allergy symptoms have come back so that what I tell people who come in annually to refill their vaccine is you can go on as long as you want. I, I never tell anybody they have to stop. And I see a fair percentage of people who, if they choose to stop, come back in a year and say, my allergy symptoms came back so that we failed to get tolerance. And this is just ballpark, maybe 20 or 25 percent of people. But then you start all over again? If they want. Uh, so I mean, what I, what I always have told people, if you choose to stop, and you, your remission fails, you got to go through the build-up period again, which is a pain. And if your insurance is paying for it and it's very effective, and you only have to come once a year and you only have to get 12 shots a year, the vast majority of people go on. I saw a guy just yesterday, the last patient of the day, who was on seven years and told me, he still knows just before he gets his next injection, he starts to feel breakthrough symptoms. So I think the data, these studies are better than the real world, or in the world that I live in. Does anybody have anybody who's more or less been on shots for most of their adult life? I've, I've heard of, I've, I, think, I feel like I've met individuals who have what stayed on it Paul? forever. Well, I mean, well, I'm just curious how many of these studies were done after they standardized the allergens, because most of these are before we had standardized extracts. So. I don't know what this data actually means in today's world because there's only one study up there. It was 2017. Everything else was 1999 and the rest. So I, I tell people they need at least three years and then they have to decide what they want to do. If they want to try and stop, stop. And if they don't, they can keep going. So I leave that up to them. But when I got into a discussion with the folks at Greer, what I'm thinking is the extracts are changing as we're going through. So one of the drawbacks with the dog extract is there's seven proteins and the extracts we have now contain one and there's people that are allergic to the other six. So that's really sort of a bother to me that we have extracts that aren't really what we think we have. Mm -hmm. So we give people shots to stuff that isn't even really what we really need. So we're, this data has got so many gaping holes in it, it's sort of hard to make some real decisions because I think we're not just doing dust mites or just doing grass. The Europeans used to always find people that were monosensitized and I don't see any of those people ever. So we're mixing stuff together and I don't know, I don't know how we're going to sort it out. But I say three to five years and let them decide. Eric uh, Wambri at the Ben Wright has some interesting mechanistic data. He's been following this effector TH2A cells to the bad guys for causing allergies. So they've looked at, um, from the uh, BM allergy group, their studies of patients on pollen versus like cat allergen. He's been tracking by fax their TH2A cells for each year of immunotherapy. And you get, I saw these data he presented last year, the first couple of years you get a dramatic drop in the TH2As, and but each subsequent year of immunotherapy, you keep losing this effector population. He was making, he followed it out for six years, I think, at that point. They kept on dropping. So he was, just from his viewpoint, saying, you know, consideration of a longer duration of immunotherapy mm -hmm. in order to knock out the uh, bad guys. Sure. 
Um, I mean, we've always he presented this last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, pollen, so, so I think that's you know provocative data. We've always you know to you three to five years and um, rarely continue on just for some people that are very adamant about continuing on. But typically, we would always stop at five. And there was some other data that suggested that. For every year of immunotherapy, you get like two to three years of remission. So mm -hmm. that was, mm -hmm. some studies indicated that. So the longer you go, you get further time before relapse. <laughs> Still clear as mud. <laughs> what's, what's the natural progression of diseases where uh, kids outgrow their asthma or adults outgrow their allergies as they get older? I mean, how does that compare with long-term effects? I was going to say that these had placebo groups, yeah. Them, which yeah, and there were some changes there. Yeah, so I mean, if you go back to that one study way back, I mean, I'm not going to slide all the way back, but there was the one where it was the kids and they were looking at asthma, and you could see that when compared to control, like we, so we assume yeah, kids can grow outgrow their asthma, right. but the controls was only 3.3 percent remission, where it's the group that got treated. While the two treatment groups were not different from each other, it certainly helped those kids along in terms of yeah. asthma asthma remission. There's also one study where they gave uh, um, kids without asthma, and uh, the chances of developing asthma in those kids who were on immunotherapy was less than kids who right. didn't have asthma. Well, that, I mean, that's always been promoted as one of the benefits of immunotherapy. If you just have rhinitis symptoms, you reduce the risk of going on to develop asthma, especially the dust mite allergy. So not only do you treat symptoms at that time, but there's data that you prevent the development of a more serious disease. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the cost part. Um, so um, when I was deciding what I wanted to talk about this week, a couple weeks back, I definitely wanted to go into the cost. And I was actually intrigued to do this. This has nothing to do with allergy shots. Um, this uh, actually was inspired by Dave John gave us a couple weeks back and he put up some numbers in regards to screening for peanut allergy. And so I thought it'd be kind of interesting to put up some values related to other conditions that we manage or at least think about in our specialty. Um, and so uh, the first one is looking at um, early screening in, uh, for peanut allergy based on leap type screening. Um, and the numbers that this one study found, this is the one that he had presented, was that basically it was a mathematical kind of uh, model that they predicted over 20 years um, based on the number of expected live births and the incident rate of peanut uh, allergy patients. Um, if we were to perform skin prick testing or uh, IgE as our method of screening, over those 20 years, it would basically be almost $650 million um, for screening um, to detect about 3,000 kids um, or peanut allergic patients. And then if it were by IgE, almost $1 billion. So Jeff Bezos could certainly fund that, but the rest of us not. Um, and so basically on average, um, it would be about 200,000, almost 300,000 to detect one uh, peanut allergy patient or one patient with peanut allergy. Um, and then looking at uh, SCID, so uh, severe combined immunodeficiency. Um, so the Swedes um, in uh, 2015 did a, this is an actual study, so this is uh, real life money. Um, and they looked at their cohort of patients um, and they reviewed costs uh, from the year 2000 to 2015 um, for patients that underwent um, stem cell transplant. Um, and they had two different groups that they evaluated early and late transplant. And that, that was defined as uh, at six months of age or earlier as the early group and six months afterwards um, for the late group. And this is kind of the average uh, cost that they found associated with these kids. Um, so this is how much per patient it was to treat. Um, and they basically stopped reviewing costs at the end of 2015 or if the child died. Um, and I just want to bring to attention, this is obviously in Sweden, so a socialized country where, where you could argue healthcare costs are cheaper. So in the United States, potentially more expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the last one is um, uh, in the United in U.S. value, although back in 2000, uh, 2005, and this was just kind of a, a, a estimate. This is not um, looking at actual data, but uh, kind of a model of if it costs five dollars uh, to do screening for every 
live birth um, and based on the incidence of SCID, um, the cost to, they would estimate the cost to detect one case of SCID um, would be about $485,000 in 2005 U.S. dollars. So then if we go into the economics of SCID, so I will say at the outset, I do not by any means think that this study is believable in terms of the numbers that they came up with. And I, I would note that actually I looked at where the authors are from. None of these authors are actually physicians, so they may not realize that these values themselves seem just insanely cheap. Um, but this is what they put out there. So they basically found that um, for a, a large insured uh, population in the United States, and this is from 2018, so pretty recent, um, and I would say just focus on this part of the slide because this is p individuals who are doing kind of inconsistent shots, so basically not adherent to their shots. Um, that insurance was paying 53 cents uh, per month for allergy shots and patients were paying 13 cents per month. So on average, one year of allergy shots was just shy of $8. Again, I don't believe it, but it was published. So uh, patients, what does that include? I mean, it, in, it included, you know, doctor's visits, the pre I mean, preparation of vials. It, it doesn't even pay for the doctor's office visit. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I, that's why I, I put it up here, but I, I don't know. The, the next studies I'm going to present certainly are more realistic, but this is one that was in the United States, and I found it, and I thought it would be intriguing to put that up there, that some people believe that this is how much it would cost. It's hard to believe that paper got peer review that anybody who knew anything about medical costs would question that. But if you look at all the patients and, and the insurance company and the people that are getting shots and you globalize the whole thing, it may come down to that cost. Mm -hmm. If you look at the 95% of people who aren't getting allergy shots and they're still paying 50 cents a month, yeah. it may actually be just a global inference. Yeah, they, is that what happens at the every clinic? Oh, yeah, we do this all the time. <laughs> 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 no. Let's send our patients to you for that. Yeah. That's, we, that's more reimbursement than some of the insurance has given us right now, so I don't know. Um, so this one is a little more reasonable. Um, this was done in Europe uh, in three different countries um, where they uh, looked at grass pollen, uh, skit, slit, um, compared to symptomatic treatment. And so in all the different countries, basically, so in Austria, they estimated about 1,100 uh, for three years of skit or basically 336 uh, euros per year. In Spain, a little bit cheaper. And then in Switzerland, about uh, this much, uh, so 1,200 uh, for the three years or 400 uh, per year. However, when they factored in kind of quality of life and asthma prevention, they generated a theoretical um, cost savings um, per patient of about uh, 8,000 euros to 11, uh, 11 or 1150 or 11, sorry, 11,500 11, per patient of uh, skit when compared to medications. Um, so basically by preventing uh, as allergic disease and asthma, um, they would on average per year be saving this much. Um, so then I thought it'd be interesting to just kind of look locally. Um, and I got some local data um, as far as how much it actually costs um, for insurance and patients um, to get three years of allergy shots. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all the numbers you can look with your eyes, um, but basically, uh, not surprisingly, the first year is going to be the most expensive because that's when you're doing more vials and preparing more. But this certainly seems kind of close to that European study that I just presented in terms of how much it's um, costing. But certainly cheaper than you know peanut allergy and and other things that we're seeing in our specialty. Um, so on an average, seems to be pretty cost effective. Um, is there a reason that year three bounces back up? I, 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 the only thing I can suspect is maybe it's just like a little bit of inflation was taken into that. But yeah, I thought that was a little bit weird that on average that one bounced back up. This is just <coughs> numbers that I actually got. Um, but I can't quite, I, I noticed that too. I don't know why it went back up. Hmm. Yeah, that surprised me. Um, okay, so then another study um, that uh, took 30 patients who had allergic rhinitis and asthma and they got treated with three years of skit and they had 10 match controls who just got medication. Um, and so they kind of followed them for three years after they got their shots and they followed both symptom scores, medication use, and uh, cost. And so the, that, those are the three outcome measures they looked at. And so this first table here is uh, looking at symptom scores. So cost is not on here at all, but as you can see, basically right away within one year of treatment for both symptom scores and medication use, um, it was a notable difference that was uh, statistically significant when compared to patients who were just um, doing medications. So this is kind of going back to the efficacy aspect of it. Um, but then again, after they stopped at three years, that 
persisted. So they still were doing better than patients who were just getting treated with medication. And then likewise, if we look at it as from a cost perspective, um, so no statistical significance in the first two years, but by the third year, there was cost savings. And then again, that persisted even after they discontinued their allergy shots. So sustained benefit from uh, that and sustained cost savings. So basically their findings were that by year two, allergy shots were less expensive. By year three, there was a 48% cost reduction. And by year six, an 80% cost reduction. And then again, symptom scores were better in this group. Um, that got treated with the allergy shots when compared to the medications. Um, and then this persisted for three years. So again, another study that says three years of shots are enough, and you stay better for three years after you stop treatment. That's better than, than I do. Um, I, maybe I've been practicing wrong all these years. I've told people to stay on longer than that and I see a failure rate after stopping, this would predict there isn't any failure rate. People just stay good. I think there's somewhat of a disconnect between real world practice and, and uh, controlled studies. You need to move to Italy. <laughs> Where was this study done? Italy. Italy. <laughs> this was in Italy? Yeah, uh, we got some Italian uh, names. Back to my first comments, Kobe spoke the language. He did. Yeah. He spoke a lot of languages. Huh? He grew up there. He grew yeah, up he there because his dad was an NBA player and mm -hmm. the end of his career moved to Italy. Kobe spoke five languages. I thought it was just three. He spoke Anyways, Spanish, he spoke Italian, he spoke some Mandarin. He was, he was a scholar too, wasn't he? Was huh? Wasn't he a Rhodes scholar or something? <laughs> All right. <laughs> bringing it back. Um, so actually, this is the last study, though. Um, so this was a, a kind of a theoretical um, study. So uh, uh, done in Germany, and they kind of looked at it and did an analysis of if, if we expanded allergy shots to more individuals who would qualify for it in, in Germany and a government uh, provided health care, um, they estimated that there'd be a cost savings uh, per year of about 1.3 to 5.7 million euros. Um, and uh, the majority of that being due to kind of preventing the development of asthma or other allergic diseases. Um, but again, significant cost savings for society as a whole. Um, and um, that's basically it. So kind of just to summarize everything that I talked about today. So um, allergy shots proven to be um, efficacious for treating um, allergic rhinitis and asthma. These studies suggest that three years um, is sufficient, um, but maybe some added benefit from five years, um, and then two years is not going to do it. And then um, this benefit is persisting for at least three years post-treatment. Um, and then it's relatively inexpensive and cost efficient and, and better than just treating individuals with medications alone. And with that, there's my references. And we're today's Bosco again. Did anybody talk about giving three or four years worth of immunotherapy in a shorter duration instead of just cutting the time interval? That's a good Actually, question. Actually, to give them four years worth of allergy shots in two years and see if that gives the same benefit as extending it out At least longer. the studies that I look at, that's an excellent question. Um, I didn't come across any. I, there could be something out there. I was not specifically looking for things yeah, like what, that. But what do you, I don't understand what you're So basically about. doing faster. Like, well, basically, we think there's a certain amount of allergen we have to give people over a period of time to get them better. So right. why not give it to them in two years instead of four and see if you get the benefit based on the dose instead of the duration. So basically going in every two weeks. Yeah. You know, once and and just seeing if we can provide the same allergen dose. I don't sure. remember one year, one year, Northwest people gave us a talk after they standardized the allergy shots and what we had to put in to get effective dosing of our shots. Mm -hmm. I was always curious, how did the one month interval evolve? I mean, that's just the way it was, but that's never been addressed again, as far as I know to give them more frequent shots at a higher dose. Well, you know, like how did know. they come up with the, the fourth, you know, every four of these shots? In the that, I don't, that's what I'm saying. I don't know where that came from. It's just out there. I don't know the answer, but I, I also, the other thing that's sort of a segue to that is, why do we know that you can stretch out venom immunotherapy to every 12 weeks? Yeah. And no one has ever asked, can we stretch out allergen immunotherapy to a different interval? We well, just sort of accept I mean, we'll, then it was super expensive, you know, to purify, and then there was a shortage, so that's why all those studies were done to stretch it out as far as you could. But and we, we learned that you could go to every you know, with the weeks. relatively cheap allergen pollen. I mean, there's no incentive there. 
Well, I mean, and it, it and might like be a patient Paul incentive that, to know you could go to every three month maintenance and wouldn't have to get shots as often. But no one studied it, right? We just yes. accept this the way it is. There's other more unique things. I mean, I don't know about your experience, but I see very few anaphylaxis patients with bee sting immunotherapy. Once they get the full dose, it just doesn't seem to ever happen. But yeah, we have people anaphylax on regular allergy shots all the time. Right. Right. So I don't think it's the same. I think there's something else yeah. that we're missing about venom versus pollen. That it, they just don't seem to behave the same way long term, from my standpoint. I'm, right. That's I right. don't know if anybody else shares that, but I almost never see a maintenance bee sting person ever have anaphylax. But I see maintenance allergy shot people anaphylax sort of all the time. What do you do then? Just basically give them the option of going back on it or stopping, whatever they want to do. Half of them don't ever want to talk to you again after they end up the lag, so they're just done. But the bee sting people, I mean, we can follow them serologically. We know what's happening. We don't have any of that data with allergy shots. It doesn't seem like. Well, people have studied the development of IgG subclass 4 and show that one of the major mechanisms of protection. Yeah. Uh, again, I mean, skid has been around for so long, no one's really studying it anymore. We just do it. Right. And all the recent studies, Kez will get to next week, where research has been done on slit. And there's a lot of new mechanisms that are being identified on a more, you know, microscopic scale. So as far as a molecular basis of the um, development of tolerance and there, there are new markers that are being explored, so maybe it'll answer kind of what you're clinically seeing, and there might be different mechanisms. So, I'll be kind of touching on that a little bit as well. If anybody would know the answer to your question, it might be people doing immunotherapy in the military, because they often have to do rush or cluster to get people shipped out of the country. Yeah. You know, get them up to maintenance dose very quickly. Well, at least in our community here, we don't do rush, so everybody builds up gradually over three to five months. And so if you cram all the antigen in in a week or something to get them up to maintenance, that, that might answer your question that to get a, a more rapid immune protection. I still you were in the military. The total, 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 you, total burden of, uh, of, uh, yeah. of yeah, What did you say, Kevin? What you were talking about. So, um, People on uh, allergy immunotherapy from the military side are always they, non-deployable. They're non-deployable. Automatically, even if they're on maintenance, they're considered non-deployable. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. During buildup, they're denift, so they're do not fly status. But once you're on maintenance, they're non-deployable. No, they can't. Yeah, no. Just and because, because, they because can't, the risk if, of if them you're being out of the Middle where. East and you can't get access to your immunotherapy, and that's the only thing that's treating your disease, yeah. they can't have it there. Yeah, you're down. Why do they? I always thought that the reason they rushed it in the military was to it's because they're people. they're the it's the fly status, so they can at least do it can be flight. local fly status. Right. So my wife works with a lot of pilots, and so if they get them to maintenance, they can actually fly for like local missions, but they can't actually be stationed overseas. Well, that's Air Force, Navy. You don't fly. But <laughs> isn't that true but for any um, medication that needs injected in the military? Yes. A lot of them, yeah. Yeah. Some of them you can get away with a waiver, but yeah, you're you're done. Yeah, if you're dependent on any injectable medication. You're not. I ran into a guy recently who was doing great on Zolaire, but was going to be shipped out in the Navy and trying to figure out how he was going to get his Zolaire out in the mid Pacific. Mm. Yeah, they're back doorways, but it's prefer it's up to the senior medical officer of the ship to decide what goes and doesn't, and. <coughs> Many times, um, and it's ultimately up to the commanding officer of the ship. So it depends on how much risk the commanding officer wants to assume. And as a senior medical officer, he may decide he doesn't want to assume any additional risk. It's all about risk management. So a lot of times they'll just defer and say, like, we just don't want anything. We don't want to keep extra medications, extra anything. So it, it's case by case, and how how much that individual's needed, like if they're the only intelligence officer that's available for the region, they'll probably make an exception. But if it's kind of a, you know, a very common position, they may not make that exception. It's the number of shots given by the military is unbelievable because when I was at the NIH, we got the tour of the Walter Reed Allergy Lab. And they're giving like 50,000 people here shots in the military. So their lab is huge. Oh. Is all the antigens still made at Walter Reed for the whole military? All the extracts are made there. I don't know where the antigen comes commercially or whether they make their own antigen, but all the shot mixes is done there. 
should ask John Walker and Jay Springer to come back and answer some of those questions because they would both have extensive experience in both. Yeah. Jay, I, I kind of got an email from Jay. He's skiing in the Pyrenees right now. It's a <laughs> tough life after 20 years in the military and then you retire with a pension. Yeah. So did John. Uh, huh? John Walker. John, we could ask. He's still over working hard in eastern Washington. What percentage of people in your practice with sort of a classic hay fever did you put on shots, do you think, versus just medical treatment? I just present it as an option to them, and if they're doing well with nasal steroids, then half of them will say they don't want to, and the other half don't want to take medicine. So I just make it a decision that they make, and I don't really push it. So when somebody... No, it's... So for people who have uh, severe reactions to shots, do you put them um, along with Zoller? You know, there, are, there is data that you give Zoller along with the shots. The chance of having a severe reaction will reduce. I have one patient like that, so I just want to see how commonly it's done. Yeah, I think you live in a different world, because for me to get Zolair for an off-the-label use like that, I can't get it. So you, with you at the university, I don't know how you guys get stuff approved. It, it <laughs> so works you, really you well for you. on shots with the protection of Zolair? Hmm. I, I would agree. I don't know how you get Zolair approved. <laughs> only if they have asthma. I think he had asthma. Only, only yeah. if they have asthma. So I also want to point out to the fellows that uh, not all allergens are standardized, only short ragweed, cat, dust mites, and uh, venom and grasses. Um, so we know they're stand standardized, meaning we know how many units of allergen is present in each ML. But trees are not the same and you know, other allergens. So I don't know if all patients are uh, sensitized to that major allergen, what other allergens they are sensitized to. I don't know if component testing is the answer in the future. Um, you know, like the way we do it for food. Um, I, I know that there are tests done uh, for research, but <coughs> um, so if we can put them on shots through, based on component testing, I don't know if that's going to help. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the problem years ago in Hopkins, they, as I remember, tried to immunize people just with the major allergen of ragweed. Uh, thinking if you standardized it, that would be better. Actually, the outcome was worse. And if you use just crude ragweed extract, which contained minor <coughs> allergens, because a number of people, their primary allergen is the minor one, not the major one. Major just means the dominant number people in the population were allergic to that. And so it was better to just use raw ragweed with all the different allergens and to try and make it perfect and just immunize with the major allergen. But to some extent, standardizing it, you, you fool yourself into thinking you have greater efficacy by being more precise. This is still a pretty crude practice that we do here, um, and yet it works remarkably well. But I think only cat and ragweed are standardized based on major allergens. Like grasses and other things, they still have all the other allergens. Um, we just know the exact allergy units that are present in each ML for all these allergens. Any other comments? Well, Kathy, you, you showed earlier data that there was no change in lung function with the asthma studies. Yeah. And then later you showed a decrease in ICS and symptom scores yes. with people. I'm just trying to get square that in my head about how can that happen if there's studies that show no change in lung function, but yet later on you show that they don't need as much well, medication, I think, I mean, One person raised a point that it could be that just individuals are going off their medications because they think they can. I mean, that's why nowadays I think a lot of these ads, like I know Zolair and Pix, and if you're getting treated for asthma, they tell you, you know, don't stop your asthma medication unless your doctor tells you to. Um, and so I'm sure some of, the, some of that's skewed by individuals going off their uh, medications. Um, and then, uh, you know, I guess, the, the only other thing I could think is patients are just less symptomatic, so they're using their uh, inhalers, yes, or they're going down the dose, but then they're still not showing any difference in the FEV1. But yeah, no, I don't know. So part two of immunotherapies next week, Kez is going to do it. <laughs> and for the old guys in the room, this side of the room, uh, what about Nick? And around the corner. <laughs> we, we, need, we need you guys to come next week as well because Sublingual got introduced, you know, once we were already 20 years into practice, roughly.